This is flipped mini lecture number 33. It covers torque and its relationship to angular acceleration. Now, I need to review a couple things because we're going to use it a lot bunch. So if you measure theta in radians, then the amount of arc that is traversed out, if you have an angle delta theta, that amount of arc there is r delta theta. And if delta theta is 2 pi, then you've got 2 pi r. So there's 2 pi radians in a circle. Okay, something that we define is omega is by definition the derivative with respect to time of the angle. Sometimes you'll see formulas like this, omega equals delta theta over delta t. Beware, that is only good if you have a constant rate of change or if you're taking the limit that delta t is going to zero. Alpha, the angular acceleration, is by definition the time derivative of omega. So, of course, since omega is a time derivative of theta, you also have that alpha is equal to d squared theta dt squared equivalent. And sometimes you'll see alpha is equal to delta omega over delta t. But once again, this is only good if, in this case, the angular velocity is changing steadily. If the angular velocity is uh, not just changing, but it's changing more quickly with time, or it's uh, s not just slowing down, but it's slowing down even more quickly with time. It's like not just somebody kind of applying the brakes, but somebody applying the brakes harder and harder, then uh, you can't use that formula unless you take the limit that delta t goes to zero. These are the definitions. Now, this formula here that I gave you, uh, it seems kind of like this formula and seems kind of like that formula. That is, hey, if I've got, uh, this should be a V tangential here. If I've got an angular velocity omega and I multiply by the radius, then the amount of angular position traced out is just r times the uh, rate of change. This rate of change is r times that rate of change. Why? Because this rate of change is r times that rate of change. And this formula seems like it's pretty logical. Turns out it actually has a correction term in it that we haven't gotten into at all. And the correction term is plus 2 uh, v radial omega. And you know what? I'm not going to explain that. I mean, this is getting stinking advanced enough already. I want you to take that on belief that if not only the thing is going around in a circle, but the radius of the circle is changing, so it's going around in a circle, but the circle's getting bigger and bigger, or it's going around in a circle, but the circle's getting smaller and smaller, that there's a correction term. Okay. All right. So you have to believe me. Let's write down Newton's law. Newton's law says that F equals ma, and it's true for any particle. It's absolutely true unless you get all the way up into quantum mechanics or special relativity, in which case there's uh, correction terms, or in the case of uh, special relativity, or ways of reinterpreting this in the case of quantum mechanics. So for now, and for the foreseeable future, F equals MA, and that's that. There's not, this is not an approximation. Now we can make any old point in space that we like, and we can see our particle over here that has mass M, and our particle's got some acceleration. Okay, it's got some acceleration, and there it is. Now we are totally welcome to, if we wish, we got this point here, we got the point there, even though the particle's not moving in a circle around that point, 
we are welcome to, if we wish, set up a coordinate system such that this here is the radial direction and this here at this moment is the tangential direction. And we call the unit vector that points in this direction, we call that unit vector r hat. And we call the unit vector that points in that direction, we call that unit vector theta hat. So that's the radial one, that's the tangential one. And we certainly can, if we're given this acceleration, we can break this acceleration up into an acceleration that points in that direction and an acceleration that points in that direction. And the sum of those two together is that whole ve acceleration vector right there. So in other words, we're going to write A is equal to A radial times R hat plus A tangential times theta hat. Now the interesting thing here is that A tangential is R alpha plus 2, with the correction term, R alpha plus 2 VR omega. So that means if I was to do something like take the tangential component of both sides of this equation, what I would get is that F tangential is equal to M times A tangential, but A tangential is that mess. Okay, R alpha plus 2 VR omega. Now, now that I've got that, you can forget this term, okay? I'm never going to give you a term problem that has an expanding radius. Just not, okay? So forget that term. That's the kind of formulas that we'll work with, generally speaking. But now I'm going to keep on going and using this, okay? So here's how I'm going to use this formula. You see this arbitrary point in space that I've chosen? You see where the particle is? Well, there's some radius here, which we've been calling r, so I'm going to highlight it there. There's some radius there, and I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by r. So on the left-hand side, I've got r times f tangential. And on the right-hand side, I've got m r squared alpha plus 2 v r omega. Now this thing that's on the left-hand side, the radius times the tangential component of the force has a name. And it's called the torque because we're already using t for time and we're running out of variables, it's given the symbol lowercase tau. That's called the torque. And now we've got the right-hand side of this equation, which hopefully I've multiplied out correctly. m r squared alpha plus 2 v r omega, and I need one more, I need an m over there, which I can get like that, and then I can also do that. Okay, so now I've got the right-hand side substituted in for the tangential acceleration. Now get a load of this. This thing right, this all seems useless, but this right here is d by dt of something. What's it d by dt of? It's d by dt of omega r squared. Why? Well, because you take d by dt of omega, and that's alpha. So, product rule, alpha, that, taking d by dt of that factor gives me alpha, and I have the r squared. Plus, I've got the omega, take d by dt of that mass, well, that's 2r dr dt. And, of course, dr dt is the radial component of the velocity, so that's 2r v sub r. So, that there matches that there, and that there matches that there. So the right-hand side of this thing is m d by dt of omega r squared. 
All right, well, let's rewrite that a little bit more. Okay, so I've taken my omega r squared. I've taken the m that was on the outside. I've brought it on the inside. I've taken the, the r squared that's in here. I put one of the r's there, and I put one of the r's there. Okay, seems like I'm just making a mess, but this thing here, r omega, that's d tangential. And m times v tangential is the tangential component of the momentum. So the right-hand side is d by dt of r times the tangential component of the momentum. And this thing has a name. It's called the angular momentum. So to sum up entirely what I've shown, okay, is if you call tau equals the radius times the tangential component of the force, which we call the torque, and this is a definition. And if you call L, which is by definition the radius times the tangential component of the momentum, which we call the angular momentum, then I just showed you that tau is equal to dl dt. And oh, I, I didn't do anything much. I just said that I had some arbitrary point in space. I had a radius vector to the point where the particle's at. I considered the force that was on the particle. I took the tangential component of the force. I took the, and I found out that that is the time rate of change of R times the tangential component of the momentum. Now it turns out, of course, if this is true for any one particle, then if I have 150 particles over here, it's true for all of them. I can just add this. So the grand total of tau would be uh, the sum, I equals uh, 1 to capital M, or 150 or whatever, of the radius to the ith particle times the tangential force on the ith particle. And L, in this case, would be the sum, I equals 1 to M, of the radius to the ith particle times the tangential momentum of the ith particle. And then you have that uh, for the whole system, if this is the grand total of the torque and the grand total of the momentum, for the whole system, you have uh, tau is equal to dl dt. Now there's one thing I've cheated you on, but this is already very proof heavy. What I've cheated you on is that if these particles are all acting on each other, say, like so this one is acting on that one, and that one's acting back on that one, and this one's acting on that one, and that one's acting back on that one, and this one's acting on that one, and that one's acting back on that one. What I haven't told you is that all those mutual forces between the particles can be completely ignored when you're calculating the total torque. It's one of those sort of perfect cancellation situations. Uh, it's already proof heavy. I'm not going to go into it. Now, this was a chapter on rigid bodies. And before I lay my pen down, I have to relate this new and cool general theorem, which is actually true for whether or not you've got a rigid body spinning on an axis or not. It is actually just a good old true theorem. But it has a very nice special case if you've got a rigid body. So as usual, in our let's model our rigid body as some point masses. There's one, there's two, dot, 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 there's M. Let's model our rigid body as some point masses that are all locked together to each other. And then let's drive a stake through some part of the rigid body and make that the point about which we're doing this computation. So this rigid body can only spin around this point. Now, if these particles, as usual, have mass m1, m2, dot, 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 m sub m, and if these radii, that radius is r1, and that radius is r2, dot, 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 and that radius is rm, then there's a nice simplification here. 
all they can do is spin around this, and if the rate of spinning is given by an angular frequency, omega, then this simplifies a load. P tangential for the ith particle is m times v tangential for the ith particle. But v tangential for the ith particle is however way far away it is from the uh, point that all this crud is spinning around times omega. So that's ri omega. And it's not ri omega i because they're all stuck to each other in some lockstep way. So there's only one omega here. And that should be m sub i. OK. So that means that the sum here now in this situation simplifies quite a bit. This becomes, because there's only one omega here, we, that pulls out of the entire thing. And we have omega times the sum i equals 1 to capital M of ri squared times uh, mi. Okay. Now look at that part that I boxed. L is equal to, in this case, omega times i, where i is something we calculated when we uh, got into the total kinetic energy of the object. So now we have two kind of cool facts. The angular momentum of an object is omega times its moment of inertia. And the kinetic energy of a spinning object is 1 half times i omega squared. And these formulas, even though we've gone to a lot of work to derive them, if you want to just kind of memorize them, you can kind of memorize them as being analogous to the corresponding formulas that we had much earlier, which are that momentum is equal to uh, mass times velocity. And here, uh, in the particle case, k was 1 half times mass times velocity squared. So you can see that the moment of inertia is playing kind of the same role as the mass, and the omega, which is the angular velocity, is playing kind of the same role as the ordinary velocity. V omega m i. Now, and I want to stress something though. This isn't a new or different kind of momentum really, or a new and different kind of kinetic energy, really. At a deep down level, we have derived these things using the same Newton's laws that we originally had. They're not new laws. They're new formulations of the very simple set of laws that we had several chapters back. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. We've covered 12.5 and 12.6. And we have proven, more generally than Knight, actually, I'm a little bit disappointed in his lack of rigor on this particular subject. Um, we've proven that torque is equal to the time rate of change of angular momentum. And then we've gone to a special case where all of the parts of the body are forced to rotate around a fixed point. And in that case, we've seen that the angular momentum is just the moment of inertia that you already know times the angular rotation rate. The last thing I want to do to sum up is I want to put this formula for L, which is a special case, into this thing, which I've proven, and get a new thing. Tau is equal to d by dt of i omega. Well, now i is just a property of the object. It's not going to change unless the object isn't rigid or unless you move where it's nailed down. As long as you stick to the one point where it's nailed down and spin it around that and don't let the object deform, I is not going to change. So I can come outside of the d by dt. It's some constant, which leaves the d by dt just to hit the omega. And d by dt of omega is alpha. So what we've shown is that for a rigid body, tau is equal to i alpha. And that's night 12.32. And on Monday, we'll see if we can apply all this stuff.